Until a few years ago, I had no idea that a huge part of the collection here was the Supreme Court files. Um, I was fortunate enough to work on the Tennessee Judiciary Museum next door, which opened in 2012. Um, it was a super privilege to work with Clerk of the Appellate Courts, Mike Catalano, and also Court of Appeals Judge Andy Bennett, who's quite a historian, on putting together exhibit cases, explanatory panels, um, an interactive media program, and we've done several phases since then where we've updated it, and um, a lot of this has to do with, and the ongoing work there is delving into these files and finding more material that can relate to important issues even that face us today. Um, if you've not been to see the museum, it's right next door in the Supreme Court building. What they did is, and you can go, it's free, um, it's open Monday through Friday, nine to five. What they did is they gave us the front part of the old library. The way that building is set up, the Supreme Court, well, the courtroom that's used for all the courts on the right and on the other side, equal side, is the library. And now, because of electronic media, they don't need as much space as they did, and so they dedicated it to becoming a museum, and we converted the space. And basically, in this photograph, you can see, you see those poles. Those are where the book racks were. We just took them down, because it's, these are metal. It's all built in, and so we had to work kind of with the bays of the bookshelves. And it could all be put back together if it needed to be at some point. Um, and so they had their own artifacts. I mean, there are things like the chairs, the desks, um, the coat racks, the spittoons that were custom made for that building that are period 1937, and it's worth going over there to see including the floors, the tile floors over there. Uh, I don't know, I may have a picture of a floor in a minute, but they're kind of a wonderful orange co contrasted with gray and black. Um, but Judge Bennett and uh, Mike Catalano had already been working on helping to secure funds to process these records, and they played a part, I'm pretty sure, in getting Ancestry involved in the partnership. And so part of that is what's funding the work you all are doing, Zach and Ricky, on the, on the files. Um, and what we have now, though, as a result of this, is a, an online database you can query. Not many of the files are digitized yet, but this query system really allows you to do some back and forth. And I'm going to show you a couple of the query pages. Um, Kim Wires oversees the whole collection. She's a great and helpful person and really understands this voluminous um, group of files. And Carol Roberts, who is over Conservation Lab here, is amazing. And we worked very closely with her on this first case, which was about the conservation of the records. And if you look up in the upper left, those is kind of blurry, I apologize, but those folded up files are what Lou was talking about, where all of them were folded up and they had been in boxes and they had this cold soot on them because they were stored over there um, in the attic. And what, what's also in there besides the files of either handwritten or typed up um, cases and the summaries and opinions and um, testimony and depositions and answers and, and so forth are artifacts that were used as quote unquote exhibits in the cases to prove or to demonstrate what's being talked about. And so I just wanted to show you one example. In the lower right corner here, um, there are some ambrotype photographs. And these, um, there are some, and there are three albumin photographs too, mounted on cabinet cards. And you can't see them very well at all, but when you, you know, see something like this, they actually are imprinted with the name of the photographers in Scotland, Kilmarnock, Scotland, okay? These were used as evidence against a person claiming to be a relative of someone who had died without a will in Memphis. And the relatives from Scotland sent these photographs over to show the family, direct family lineage and to show that this woman who was claiming to be a cousin was not. So, and because of the type of photograph they are, the, when the, 
photography studio was in business, they could also use that to confirm the date of the photographs and their authenticity. So that was a real interesting example um, that we used. Oh, there's the floor. Um, so the cases over next door contain not only these historic objects that we found in cases, they also, as I said, they represent periods of time. And a lot of the cases over there show concerns that might have been very indicative of where Tennessee was in its history at the moment. And in the center case, we also we have a display of replicas of the three state constitutions over there. The originals are here. And when the museum opened, there was a period of about, I think it was three days, and the state troopers had to be there 24 hours standing next to these documents. But it was pretty amazing to get to look at these constitutions and look at the signers. Um, Two, because a lot of people came and saw their relatives, and you can, these are now digitized online. You can look, you can read the state constitutions in the handwriting versions and look at the signature pages, because part of the project was we cooperated with the State Library and Archives, and they digitized the constitutions, and these are replicas, what's over there now? But the fact that they had to be digitized means now they're accessible on the State Library website, which is pretty great that we have that. You know, it's, it's, it's nice to read something in printed transcription, but to read it in the real handwriting is a rare treat. Um, but this, the case that's in there now, and we've changed out these center cases several times, but it's the 1870 Constitution and a case from 1870, and it was one of the very first taken up by the new court after they passed the new constitution after the Civil War. It was heard in September of 1870, and in um, East Tennessee, it was a case of uh, someone's widow who was claiming that his death was due to the fact that um, partisan Confederate sympathizers in Upper East Tennessee had harassed him, chased him out of his home. He ended up joining the Union Army up in Kentucky and got captured, ultimately went to Andersonville Prison, went through horrible conditions of all those prisons were, but Andersonville was notoriously so, and ultimately died. And so the Supreme Court, here they are, you know, trying to kind of think about how to pull this state back together, and you've got one of these, you know, feuds uh, in the country up in East Tennessee, and they ultimately ruled that he, they, the neighbors, partisans, couldn't be held accountable for something that he did of his own will, which was join the Union Army, and that getting into the results of what happens when people are at war was not something they could, if I I mean, that's a lay version, Lou, of, uh, of what it was. But it's, a, but it's really interesting because it makes you so aware of what it was like here in Tennessee. And two of these judges on the, the new Supreme Court, T.A.R. Nelson and James Dederick, um, had been involved in the lower court proceedings. So they both had to recuse themselves. So everybody was kind of involved. Now, at MTSU, my job is to help research and assemble digital projects. Um, and so we have some collections that are our own that come from field work for the Center for Historic Preservation of 30 years time where they, we staff students, many students at MTSU and Dr. West, who's the head of the Center for Historic Preservation and now the Tennessee State Historian too. So he's kind of an, an advisory uh, person to TSLA, very, very closely involved here. Um, so much of his work and the center's work documenting places all across the state, we're starting to put those, that's our own permanent collection, so to speak. So those things are from MTSU. But we're also doing virtual digital collections. And here is an exhibit, here's an example of a, a project called Trials and Triumphs, that when you click on it, I'm not gonna try that here, it should have the link in it, but I think we'll, we'll go forward so we can see everything. But take a look at this. And what this is showing you is these are five themes, these bands, 
Each one of them will lead you into something that looks very familiar to you because it's done in the content DM um, image and data management system, just like TSLA's uh, TIVA. And so when you look at, you'll see all the metadata listed underneath. Um, and you'll know where the image came from because most of these are from other institutions. It'll show you, you know, click on the credit, click on through to the institution in many cases if you wanted to contact them. Most of the images on here are actually adequate for doing a PowerPoint with. You know, they're 72 DPI, so it's intended for students and teachers to use these to look at an actual historical document, a primary source in many cases, and be able to use it for history. And so that's really what we're about. Um, this project, which covers the period 1865 to 1945, um, was a, funded by the Tennessee Board of Regents. And the main emphasis of it is on citizenship. It's claiming rights. Our focus primarily was on African American Tennesseans post-Civil War and how they created institutions, um, built community, started schools, did whatever was necessary, served in the military to exercise their rights as citizens. It also includes um, materials about immigrant groups. We're currently expanding this into um, a site that's going to be called Trials, Triumphs, and Transformations. So it's going to widen out at the bottom. We're really going to concentrate also on um, the early 20th century, post-Civil War, late 19th, early 20th, uh, transformation of agriculture and industry into modern industry and how this state came together because we feel like Tennessee has an amazing um, history that is American history in so many, we have three different periods of history that marched across the state so it gives us this advantage, that wide geography gives us an advantage of being able to chronicle three periods of American history as well and we feel like we were such a proving ground and testing ground during the Civil War occupied early. Both armies were here. Institutions started getting built even during the Civil War. Um, so when we started working on this, I thought, OK, let's go look at the Supreme Court records to see what's in there that might work for this, because a lot of this material hasn't been widely used, isn't widely known. You know, it's kind of like, OK, let's go. Um, so here's an example of the database. Um, I combed through it, and I really went through what was in there, but it's being constantly added to, so my work would need to be updated too. Um, but you can query under keyword, uh, the case name if you know it, a range of dates, a county, um, just a person's name, or I, for this, I was searching under, I searched under segregation, I searched under race, I searched under Negro, I searched under colored, I searched under African American, I searched under Jim Crow, actually. And um, all of these things yielded results because the people who are currently entering in these tags and metadata are, you know, history background people, cognizant, so they're putting in things that might actually help a modern person come up with something. But I wanted to, um, caution you too to try to think in historical terms. You know, think about, there may be quotes in some of these uh, in, this, in the description of it here, and they might have used the actual language. So you may have to use terms that are no longer in fashion. And one example I wanted to mention, just a tip for you all to think about, and many of you may know this. Zeta Law and I worked on a project with the State Library and Archives that was uh, adding an African American layer to the Civil War GIS. Many of you may have used that Civil War GIS. Um, they're now, it, this is called Landscape of Liberation. And so you, if you start into it from that home page, it'll take you into that part of the GIS and it'll only turn up things where uh, events, people, places have to do particularly with African American history. Um, and a lot of what we were doing was finding um, historical documents that have been scanned, books, publications, a lot out there now in PDF form in many cases. And I was fortunate 
uh, to be sharing an office with a computational sciences master's student at MTSU. She was working for us as a tech person, and I got to sit with her in the same office. And she said, use Adobe Acrobat to convert those PDFs to optical character reading, and then you can word search them. And so by doing that, you've made, you know, it's a little bit of a workaround, but you've made yourself a tool. Um, but again, you know, think about the historical language, and you might want to search several different ways with terms to turn up what you're looking for, because don't, just because you performed one search and didn't find anything, that doesn't mean it doesn't occur in some other form or fashion in there. And of course, optical character reading is a little weird, too, so. Um, now, for this project, we were really working curatorially. Um, we let what we were finding across the state in partner institutions dictate the themes we came up with. So, back to here, look at the second entry. Um, the Ida B. Wells case, challenging public railroad car segregation, we said, oh, okay, this is great. We can use this as an anchor for this theme of transportation within a category called claiming space, which has to do essentially with everyone moving into the public realm and what that meant. Um, so you can see the way this works. If you click on those, then you'll get the content DM entry, and there's an example. So, so the digitized cover of that case um, here, and this case is doubly important for us, not only because of the prominence of the complainant and what this ultimately meant, even though the Tennessee Supreme Court ruled for the railroad and against Ida B. Wells, um, but one of the attorneys, Thomas Frank Castles, was the first African-American attorney admitted to the bar in Memphis. He also served in this General Assembly for one term. And if you all haven't seen the, there is an exhibit that the, online that the State Library and Archives has done about those early legislators, and I think that, that um, NPT's uh, feature on that was really based in the work that was done here. Um, so here you have um, a handwritten transcript of Ida B. Wells' testimony. I mean, this is fascinating to come and read. And this, these pages have been digitized, partly, I think, for our project, but they may already have been under underway. But, um, but when you do a digital project like this, sometimes you end up paying fees to the organization to, you know, minimal, but they have to take some work to do, and it takes people's time to do. But then once these things are digitized, like the constitutions, then they're available. Um, so the brief over here is also, this is a nice little printed booklet. This is part of, in the case record. Um, it was printed in Memphis. You know, it gives you the address, it gives you the names of the attorneys that Castle's been worked with as of counsel. So there's, there's a lot of information in these things once you get into it. Um, and so then um, the case above this, um, I don't know how well you can see it, um, 1921, it's a case um, brought by an African-American homeowner in East Nashville, bringing a case of fraud against a realty company, Bransford Realty Company. And I was really intrigued by this, and I kept it in the back of my mind, and um, we currently at the center are working on a Northeast Nashville community history project um, because of the rapid transformation of when you cross over onto Main Street into East Nashville, you see this happening in the, the neighborhood to the north of Main, where uh, Meg's is. That is a historically African-American neighborhood that we, most of us believe, dates back to the contraband camp that was there in Nashville. And it a, has a long, proud history. There's some beautiful neighborhoods and houses back in there that had been cut through by the interstate when it came through, but also Ellington Parkway. So there's been a lot of change in that neighborhood that right now I think is the greatest change that's ever happened. And we are working at the invitation of the um, neighborhood groups over there to try to try to make this history known, capture in whatever way for the, um, the future, the memories, 
the history there. It was very much involved in the civil rights um, movement out of First Baptist Church East Nashville, the high school East, which was uh, subject to a, of a lawsuit to desegregate, is right up the road. And those things that are that are brought forward in community meetings and scanned and so forth will be in the Nashville Public Library special collections, because we're we're not collecting them for NTSU. We're just you know trying to do an assist here, and there will be. Um, two public meetings, two public public programs actually connected with that. Two Saturdays in October. The first one, Saturday, October twenty second, will be at First Baptist East Nashville. The following Saturday, the twenty ninth, will be in the main auditorium at the National Public Library because we're partnering together, and um, those will be open to anybody. It's going to be an exciting moment, but it's also a moment to kind of call to action and pay attention to our in the boom time here, things that might possibly be lost. But this case give, gives us now, over working over there, an opportunity to really delve into um, delve into a, an individual uh, life. So Cornelius V. Lane and his wife Elizabeth Lane purchased the southerly 36 feet of lot number three in Johnson Bransford subdivision, fronting on the east side of 8th Street in March 1906. So 15 years later, Lane charged the company had, I mean, essentially his lawyers made the argument that they'd intimidated him into believing he needed to refinance. When you read the terms of this and you see that if you miss one payment, everything goes back and, you know, it's all over and you don't have any recourse pretty harsh. Um, and then during that, his ownership was switched to a different parcel, apparently. Um, so Metro Archives, now on the in the public library downtown, which is hugely helpful to all of us history people, because you can just walk over there if you need something instead of have to drive to Green Hills. Um, and they have a great space and super people to help you. They have an amazing set of Davidson County plat books that show these early subdivisions. So when you find that language in there, um, the deed wor wording says W.L. Foster's plan of Edgefield and Johnson Bransford's edition. So, I mean, pardon my crummy photographs, but you know how it is. You're doing, you're trying to do the research and you're doing that too. So using, so there, this little bit, and Hopkins Atlas of Nashville, you have to flip this in order to make it make sense. But we were able to locate this address on 8th. And then they also happen to have Lane's marriage certificate over there. We were just looking to see what else we could find. They have the city directories and they have um, other interesting uh, things. But the, um, the outcome here, um, essentially, let me go back a minute because I, I lost two slides in the transaction here, but anyway, um, the outcome is that in 1920, looking at the census in 1920 and looking at the, um, at the city directory, you can see where Lane was living. By 1920, his first wife had died. He's living at this address on 8th. He is a driver for a coal company, uh, cart, a cart driver for a coal company. His wife, who's by this time Elizabeth, Lizzie is passed away, and um, Molly he's married to, and she's a house cleaner. In, 19, in the 1930 census, they're on 7th. So the same two, he's now self-employed as a coal cart driver and she's still cleaning houses, but they've moved around to apparently, he must have lost this case. And this is where um, being able to have people who are cognizant, and there are some on the staff here who can help you then look up, you know, was there a published verdict? Many times these don't have anything more than what was brought forward. And of course the Supreme Court is an appellate court, so these are appeals. And so I'm going to show you now how you have to 
often to find the rest of the case or from the beginning of the case go to the appropriate county that holds the records for earlier. So I've been working on, this is my dissertation topic, but what's happening right now is we're working toward an exhibition opening in the Museum of East Tennessee History in Knoxville. And so we're still kind of all hands on deck researching this because there is so much. Um, it really is, uh, it continues to, just like the Supreme Court records, this continues to unfold. And, um, and I just realized I have, I printed out just the beginning of that Cornelius Lane case. If you want to pass it around, if anybody wants to just take a look at that. Um, and also the entry, the way it looks in the database. Um, so since 2004, when I encountered the fact that we had a huge marble industry in Tennessee at one time, I was at the U.S. Capitol doing a research on Tennessee artists and architecture. And when I got there, they said, well, we want to know about all this marble that's in this building. It's on the interiors that were added in the 1850s. And um, I, they said, it's Tennessee. I grew up in Washington. I knew nothing about this. Only later learned that the uh, National Gallery of Art, both buildings, is clad in Tennessee pink marble from East Tennessee. And it's unfolded. I mean, it was a huge industry. But I thought, oh, okay, great. You know, I'm at the, the Capitol Architect's office. They have voluminous records. Okay, you know, this is worth looking at because, and so I came back to Tennessee I came here and uh, to see what, and I talked to Van West, and I said, Van, I think you know, here's a great, exciting story. And um, he said, well, let's you know pull together what you found up there, and let's see what you can find down here. Well, um, it ends up that the, um, the two extension wings of the U.S. Capitol were built at the same time as this state capitol was being built. And the architects knew each other. And the interiors have similar elements. Both of them have marble from East Tennessee staircases. Um, so the state capitol building records are here, treasure trove. And, um, and so I started to learn that the marble for, and here is a map that Zeta Law really helped me put together. She designed this and did it. But this shows you the extent of the Upper East Tennessee marble areas, and I want to particularly um, direct your attention to Upper East Hawkins County. That's where the marble for the interior of the Capitol came from in Washington. The marble for the interior of this Capitol came from Knoxville. So, a lot of what I did for my dissertation research was look at maps and geological information and publications, because that's where most of the info was. There weren't any published books that I could find. You know, there are little mentions here and there, and there's a great book now on the history of the U.S. Capitol, and very well done by Bill Allen, who is a longtime historian there, and well worth having, and he tells everything in great detail. But, um, but when I started, um, it was a piece by piece thing. So the in the files here, there is a file on the Washington National Monument. This was this is on the inside of the Washington Monument. It it this stone representing Tennessee is pink marble from Hawkins County. It was furnished by a man named Orville Rice, who was contacted first by. Uh, Gerard Troost, who was the state geologist, because all the states were asked to send a, send a block of your best stone. Well, it sort of sounded like they were going to build it out of that. That was not the case. This was a fundraising scheme. And if you got enough subscribers from your state, each one would get a, a lithograph of the design. And there's an example of it here, the certificate with the, the what you get if you're a subscriber. And um, and so it ended up, the state geologist passes away during this time, but the governor of Tennessee um, orders this to be done, and he, Orville Rice, 
who has the only marble mill in Tennessee in 1850, it's the only one listed in the Census of Manufacturers, gets $300 to create this, send it to Washington, um, ship, ship it down river from Hawkins County, put it on the train, it went down to um, Savannah or Charleston because the railroads at this moment are not completely finished everywhere. And it went up by boat to Baltimore and was hauled over. That's the way, that's the way that one went. Um, but, so here is a, just a plan of the, um, of the monument itself done by architect Robert Mills. Um, the superintendent of this construction was a man named William Doherty, who was an accomplished marble man in Irishman in Washington who had worked through, he worked at the Treasury Building, he worked at the old post office. He was appointed superintendent of construction. He is the link to how the Tennessee marble got into the capital. This man went into the marble business down here in Hawkins County. Um, so when I learned this, when I started to see how this was going to come together, um, Dr. Wayne Moore, who you all know, suggested to me, he said, oh, you know, go up to Hawkins County to the county archives. Look and see if there are any court cases up there. Because the, if you can find one, those are often very rich sources of information. Um, so I did, and I found a lawsuit by the son and the widow of William Doherty up in Hawkins County that chronicle the unraveling of a relationship with a man who was overseeing a quarry they purchased after the, the expert, <clears throat> William Doherty's death. The son and the mother tried to go into the business and continue, it didn't work out so well. But there are lots of details there, but a lot of it I didn't really know what to make of until relatively recently um, I realized there, this case came to the Supreme Court. So the other part of it is over here. And so now, um, you know, we, I think we can flesh this out and figure out really what happened. But Doherty and his partner, Hugh Sisson, in Baltimore, I mean, they, they got the contract for the U.S. Capitol. They also furnished marble for the Ohio State House. You see the brown in there? There's marble elsewhere in this building. This building, if you've never been there, go, because it's very similar in layout to the U.S. Capitol. It's a slightly smaller version, but it's a beautiful building in Columbus and well worth a trip, and it's open. They have a crypt very similar to what's in the Capitol when you walk in, the design similar. Beautiful piece of architecture. They also furnished marble for the South Carolina State House that was being built. It was under construction before the Civil War. They sent beautiful monolithic columns of Tennessee marble from Hawkins County that were on the, the grounds and ended up getting destroyed. But if you go to the South Carolina State Capitol now, um, they will tell you where there's a lot of Tennessee marble in it. They ended up having other marble they could use. It's just those big monolithic columns never to be replaced or destroyed, it, tragically. Um, but they're very proud. When you walk in there, they'll say, oh yeah, we have all this Tennessee marble. So. Um, but here, for our capital, the contract didn't go to Doherty. I mean, didn't go to Orville Rice, the first man up in, in Hawkins County who had the marble mill in 1850. Two years later, 1852, the marble goes to a man named James Sloan, who's arrived in Nashville just a few years earlier. He, too, is an accomplished, um, like William Doherty, he's an Irishman, he's an accomplished stonemason. He comes into Nashville and starts up, and he gets this contract just right away. And I just want to show you this nice little piece. This is out of the archives at the University of the South, because Sloan furnished their cornerstone. It's a cornerstone that um, the university wasn't open until after the Civil War, but they set the cornerstone in place. It ended up um, getting destroyed, broken during the war, and somebody, probably a Union soldier, carved some little books and sent them back down way many years later. And they're in the, they're in the special collections at Swanee, these two little brown marble books that really match the marble staircase over here at the, 
capital. And so there you have a, you know, a nice document of Sloan's um, operation up here. Um, but we are still working on turning up Sloan in Knoxville, and now with the help of a geologist, I think we found the quarry. That um, there are many, many written descriptions of where this was, but they're vague. You know, three miles northwest and that kind of thing. Um, and that brings me to this. Here is an 1895 map of Knox County. Um, this is it's a little bit cropped at the bottom. You can download this from the Library of Congress. It's Advanced Coffee Hill map, and it shows you the <clears throat> the civil districts of Knoxville, and so when Zeta and I were working on, we did another map of just the Knox, Knoxville quarries, and we used this map, georeferenced it. Now this map is not, it's a good map, but it's a handmade map, and so it doesn't perfectly, everything doesn't perfectly line up, but there's a lot of good information on this map. And um, since I've been over working in Knoxville toward this exhibition, three or four individuals have come up and said, I live in a quarry. Oh, okay, you know, and then they say, but I don't know if I can see it on your map that you made of the Knoxville quarries, because we made a map that we took to public meetings and we got people to say, oh yeah, this is this used to be called this, and you know, because the map we made is based on the best available maps we had from the Tennessee Division of Geology, which are from 1921, published in 1924, and then there's one from 1960. In 1960, they went back and confirmed what 1921 did. These guys were really good and really interested in it. But they didn't, what was existing in 1921, a lot of these early ones were long gone. And so he was dealing with what was still in operation or what was recently closed. So, uh, zooming in here, I don't know whether you can see it, but up, like up, up, up here, a little bit like five more inches above my hand, it says Moro Quarry. I don't know whether you can see that. But um, one person in particular said, I, I think um, Moro Quarry is where I live. He's totally convinced. And so he lo loaned me his property deeds. So I went through the property deeds to try to figure this out. Um, and in the property deeds, it says, one of the boundary lines was established by a Tennessee Supreme Court case, a case in which a JWS Frierson sued a William Morrow. Okay, cool. So, um, so I come over here, you know, to look for the case. And there's also a case, an earlier case, in which a Richard Morgan sued a JWS Frierson. And these lands, it's all about the same lands. These are partnerships that went awry and dissolved and so forth. Um, the lands in question are definitely in the neighborhood where this person lives, but it appears there was a huge vein of marble up here. There's like one thing that appears on the, maybe two, that appear on that 1921 map, Zeta, I think. But we, from reading back in these cases, this was, they thought they had struck gold up here because this is a big vein. And um, anyway, there's all kinds of amazing info. Um, the, there's a huge Chancery Court file in the Knox County archives because this case went back and forth, back and forth on appeal. For, I mean, there were two cases and related. But there's a wealth of information about the people. The exhibits in this are all the correspondence between them. So you can really, I mean, this is very dramatic business. This is a movie. And, um, and this is the industry really just getting on its feet in the 1880s. And um, so, um, and just two days ago, I found a clue about this. This is Harper's, and this is an 1887 illustration, and it says um, a quarry near Knoxville, I think, drawn by so-and-so. Um, and we've known this print, and it has on it, it has sort of indecipherable writing over here that we've been trying to make out the name of a marble company because they often, they either put a, put a icon, a symbol on it to say, you know, this is the R with a circle on it, this is a Ross quarry or whatever. This one says on it what appears to be Procter & Brown, Knoxville, Tennessee. So, 
Proctor is a big Vermont name. And so there's a, another clue, and, and I'm not going to have time to go into that, but we're working on it because I think we're going to turn up something more here. But in Frierson's correspondence in the case here, he mentions the Harper's Weekly Group is visiting on November 17, 1886. So it's possible that one of the two quarries he was overseeing is this one. Um, and in the Morgan, the earlier case, the Morgan versus Frierson case, the final appeal, and that was filed the year before, 1885. And so I just want to, I want to read you the, the passage in, uh, in this case just to show you what else you might find sometimes. And this is, um, and I'm proud to say it's an elo eloquent passage written by an attorney, Knoxville's John Sneed. The history of the transactions that led to this partnership, I'm going to paraphrase a little bit, I mean, leave out parts, presents the usual phases of illusory hopes that inspire the speculations of the age and the collapse, heartache, and bickering that too often puts the rest in peace upon the boldest ventures. It has one notable and pleasing feature, at least, which will recompense the court for the trouble of going through this long record. It embraces in an incidental way a fine account of the richness, variety, and value of the splendid marble deposits of East Tennessee. Mm -hmm. So, you know, great, I'll use that quote for, uh, from now on. So I hope I piqued your interest in the Supreme Court case files as repositories of history you might never find anywhere else. We have state officials to thank for preserving them, making them accessible for research, but it also takes really kind of more than a village to use these at times, because even if you're lucky and persistent enough to find the corresponding lowercase files in the county archives, and you know, if they in fact exist, and you can glean amazing amounts of historical information from them, you may never really know the outcome unless the opinion is also in the files they are often separate, or was published somewhere. And even then, uh, you will likely need an expert to find where it was published, and then you will need someone to help you decipher it. <laughs> so all that is to say, um, there's a lot here. It's for those of us who love this kind of thing, everybody in this room, um, go at it, have a great time. You've got some wonderful people here who can assist you, who are working daily with these records, and who can give you hints about something else and some other place, and and, um, and every once in a while, Louis Laska will be here, and he will help, and, and others. So thank you all, and um, happy to, to answer questions, but there are other people in the room who might be able to answer them just as well, if not better, so thanks. <laughs>